All right, now let me add just a few other things that are twists, I suppose, on the whole idea of neurotransmitters. Um, we we have a, we have learned a lot of, uh, about neurotransmitters, and one of the things we have also learned is that we can mimic the effect of these neurotransmitters, like morphine, for example. It mimics the effect of endogenous morphine. Um, and essentially, th what you see in this diagram here is uh, the receptor site that is exists on the receiving neuron. And when the neurotransmitter actually comes in, it acts as a lock and key. And, and uh, that, that's part of understanding uh, how, um, how a neurotransmitter actually works. Uh, it unlocks this particular area right here, um, and it opens and then flows down into the, the um, uh, dendrite of the next neuron. Um, essentially, because of this action, we've begun to learn that we can create, actually synthetically create, uh, two different substances that are um, similar in action or very dissimilar in action um, uh, drugs to act like other substances. The first one we talk about is an agonist. And essentially what an agonist does, a really good example, um, some of you I, I may have mentioned in class and I, a lot of times I explain uh, some of the backdrop I have with understanding about pain and, and some of the medications that go with it. And uh, there's a particular drug on the market that's called Ultram. Um, people that have chronic pain um, uh, will oftentimes take this because it's, it's, uh, it is what we refer to as a morphine agonist. And so essentially what it does is it acts just like morphine. I've got to get my eye in there. It acts just like morphine, so it unlocks unlocks this area just like morphine would and it creates a sense of um, uh, a relief pain relief that comes as if you would with morphine uh, but not with all the um, consciousness clouding I mean you feel loopy and high and so forth when you have morphine uh, and kind of out of it with Ultram you don't uh, but you do get the relief that comes with it now there's another drug, kind of drug, that we can create, and it's an antagonist. And no, it's not a, it's not a character in a play. It actually blocks uh, the action of the, a drug so that the actual, what you see right here, is it makes it so that this mechanism doesn't work. It interferes with it. And um, an antagonist blocks the action. Uh, of of a particular drug and so for example um, uh, many years ago I, I had a uh, struggle with um, what we call AFibs uh, atrial fibrillation and what that means is that upper chambers of the heart don't don't beat in the right kind of rhythm well um, uh, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll have people take um, um, take a blood thinner to, so that they can reduce the risk of clotting from having these AFibs. And if you take too much of it, then you'll turn into, chemically, you'll turn into what, what we refer to as a hemophiliac. I mean, in other words, you'll bleed and you won't clot. Your blood will cease to clot. Well, um, they're essentially, we can give somebody vitamin K and it will act as an antagonist to uh, the, the drugs that oftentimes are used to uh, thin the blood. And uh, it's an antagonist, you, they, you are given it, and then uh, before long your system uh, equilibrates and you're back to having your blood clot the way it's supposed to. The key here in understanding is that antagonists always block the action. Antagonists mimic the action, okay? And that's the key to understanding an agonist versus an antagonist. Antagonist blocks, a agonist mimics.